Yo, what's going on, guys? Welcome to another Tuesday night edition of BMX Coach Live. I'm your host, three-time Olympic coach Greg Romero, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to be your coach today. Today, we're answering BMX questions in the in the live the in the live chat room here today. And uh, man, such an awesome day here in San Diego. It is springtime. Spring has sprung. Weather's beautiful. People are riding. People are training. People are traveling and going to races, man. It feels so good to start racing again. Even the guys in Europe, all my Winter Circle clients in England are actually planning on racing again here real soon as things are starting to open up uh, during the pandemic. All right, guys. So um, let me see what's going on in the chat. We have uh, Luke Braxton, Jacob James, JP. Um, let's see who else is in there. Connor Nyland says hello. Guys, hello, welcome. Welcome back to the show. If you guys are watching this on the replay, thank you guys so much for coming coming in and showing up. And also, if you guys wanna support the channel, if you find that this video helps you, make sure you guys like the video, comment, leave a comment below, and more importantly, share the video. You know, my mission on why I do this is to help out as many younger and newer riders in our sport. It doesn't matter what age. And that way, these guys that are coming into the sport, listen, the sport is so hard. It's so hard to figure out. And the more information we can give these guys, the more they're, the more they're going to be able to improve. And when they improve, they're going to have more fun. And when they have more fun, they stick around longer. And it's awesome when we can show up to the track and there's just so many people at the local track. And, the, and right now, man, the sport is growing. So, you know, while the heat is on, let's strike when the when the iron is hot, so to speak. So we're going to jump right into the Ask Coach G segment. Usually, typically, I do a presentation, but man, so many things going on here in San Diego. Um, man, I'm going to be moving here uh, in the next four, four to six weeks. Uh, we just bought a house here in San Diego, uh, been renting for the last few years here, and um, it's going to be crazy because we're going to be renovating the kitchen and I'm going to be going back and forth from the place I'm in now to the new place. So we're going to be going back and forth for like the four to six weeks. It's, it's going to be hectic. So, um, yeah, it's a lot of stuff's going on. Um, man, Audrey says, Hey coach. Ellie says, Hey guys. Uh, Luke says you coach Connor Fields. Uh, I did not coach Connor Fields. Um, he has his own private coach. I did, however, coach um, a bunch of different names, right? Like Mike Day, Jill Kittner, Corbin Chara, Dave and Herman, just to name a few that went to the Olympics. Um, and yeah, let's jump right into it. JP ask, oh, let me uh, let me switch this up to ask Coach G. Boom, there it is. JP from Canada says he wants to know how to deal with the fact that we are improving through training but still not winning. What do you tell your athletes? JP, that's a great question. So here's the deal, man. When it comes to, it's it's tough, man. Like, I think we live in a world first and foremost where we want instant gratification and we're programmed like that today. Um, you know, it, it happens, it starts, it starts and happens to end with a smartphone, right? Like most of us have social media. Me personally, I've been doing a really good job staying off social media, mainly just because I've been so busy. But, you know, when when we post or, you know, we're, we're looking for quick validation, right? Like our, our egoic mind, our subconscious mind is always looking for validation. And so what you're saying is, you know, if these if someone's working really hard and they're racing, but they're not winning, they're still wanting validation. So. I would say at the end of the day, what you need to do is figure out, well, are you improving on the track? Are you getting faster objectively around the track? Or if you're not winning, are you close to winning? If you're a guy that's struggling in the main events going, you know, that that's struggling in the back of the pack from the fifth to the eighth, the, the, the rear four guys in the race and in, in a final, are you seeing yourself jumping up to the top four, right? Are we progressing like that? And I would say at the end of the day, that's what you want to look for. You want to look for those, those marginal gains, if you will, right? Like BMX is, is so tough. It's such a hard sport. And at the end of the day, you know, even if you just train, you know, there are a lot of guys that just go out and train for two to four weeks. They don't see any improvements. 
and then they decide, you know what, training is not working. I'm just going to go back to what I feel what was working for me, which was just having fun. And hey, you know what? I have no problems with that. I pass no judgment. If your intent is to have fun, then just keep doing what you're doing. Me personally, I think winning is fun. So therefore, I'm going to work on improving, but more importantly, making improvement a lifestyle, right? It, it's just like, JP, if if you're doing this for yourself, then you know, I, I know you're an older guy and I would presuppose that you know in the game of life, it's a nonstop, it's a nonstop marathon of improving. You don't stop improving until the day after you die, right? Life is all about spiraling up regardless, right? Regardless if you're doing bad or good. Every single human being on earth has the intentions they're, they feel like they're doing the right thing for, for the given intention of improving. And here's the thing. It gets really weird because sometimes improving in regular life means moving away from pain or moving towards pleasure. Certainly in racing, you know, we want the pleasure, right? We're looking for, for I would say for the most part, for people that are going after the win, they're going for that external validation. Now, here's the secret. The secret is to develop that internal validation, right? You need to practice the programming of, of your self-talk and changing the way your subconscious mind operates in terms of programming. So what does that mean? Well, that means basically, you know, let's say after a day of training, you're going to want to practice what you're grateful for, right? Like be appreciative of what you have and be appreciative of the work that you're doing every single day. Now, if you do that, then you're winning in the marathon in the long game of having a sustainable BMX career. I mean, listen, everyone has a career, even if it's a hobby, listen, you have a career in this sport, whether you're a beginner or a professional, come on. So, you know, at the end of the day, there's a concept, right? I don't know if I have the book here. There's a concept, there's a book, one of my favorite books, a really good read. I have a lot of my winter circle coaching clients read it. And a lot of my uh, high performance, mental, perfor mental performance clients read it. It's called The Slight Edge. And basically, the premise of The Slight Edge is it's all about doing the little things every day that don't seem to move the needle that are easy to do, but also easy not to do. So the concept is you might as well do it. So here's the problem. Typically, man, I say this all the time, right? typically like let's we'll try to keep in the context of performance as it pertains to racing specifically on the BMX bike but I'll use myself this is a true story so back when I was a rookie pro back in 1995 I was training and I did really well uh won a double a pro race my first uh, my first year as a rookie won a couple more double a pro races uh the weekend after that then after that, I got really content. I was like, man, I'm doing really well. This is, kind of, this is kind of coming to me easy. So what happened was I stopped doing the little things every day that made a big difference in the long game. And slowly but surely, my performance actually started to drop. It wasn't noticeable, you know, two weeks after, two months after. But I would say, you know, six to eight months afterwards, my, my performance was really declining. And that, and that was because I stopped doing the little things that made a big difference every day for the long term. And so that's the thing. In BMX, we have a career. It's all about improving in the long term, just as much as it's always it's always all about improving uh, in the game of life, right? Okay, uh, <laughs> that was a good question. I love it. I think at the end of the day, you want to look for those those marginal gains. Um, you know, if you're not winning, okay, well, are you at least, you know, if you're, if you're finishing in the back of the pack or you're not making the mains, are you making the mains now? If you're make if you're consistently making the mains and you're always getting fifth through eighth, are you jumping into uh, that next level of finishing between uh, fourth and second, right? If you're always getting seconds and thirds, great. Are you getting closer to the guy that's always beating you? Okay. So at the end of the day, I think that's how you have to look at it. Winning, winning isn't everything, okay, straight up. I mean, winning a BMX race is pretty darn hard, okay, straight up. It's, it's really hard to do. All right, let's jump to the next question. 
getting a couple of hay coaches coming in. Andy Lim, Audrey, again, uh, Lazari says he's racing right now. Um, Luke says, so you have a wife? Yes, absolutely. Uh, Jacob James, my local track is looking good. Kiwi John, he made it. He's 55 years old, still late to most things. Ha. Huh? All right. Let's look at some questions. Let's see if Ellie has a question here. Hey, coach, due to COVID, I haven't raced before or gone against anyone of my level. How do I get over the fear of a first race? Well, I would ask you this, Ellie, what does fear mean to you? Okay. Are, are you fear of, do you have fear of getting hurt? Fear of, cr fear of crashing, fear of failure, fear of embarrassment, shame. I, what, what are your fears, right? Um, because at the end of the day, maybe you're just experiencing nervousness and nervousness is also, um, nervousness is the same physiology, kinesthetic feeling of excitement, just with a different label. So maybe perhaps you might need to reframe how you look at your first race. You have to start looking at your first race as opportunity, as fun, as a chance. You know what I'm saying? So an opportunity, fun, and, and having a chance to do well. Here's a key, Ellie. You want to focus on what you want, not what you don't want. That's, that's the key here. Okay, let's go to the next question. Jacob James, I went from 175s to 180s. I feel I'm I feel like I'm chopping at the third turn. Is that a problem? Things could work. What are some things I could work on? Um, sprints, etc. FJ. What do you mean by FJ? Sprints. Okay, so Jacob James talk is talking about jumping from 175s to 180s, five millimeter difference in actually it's technically it's a 10 millimeter if you think about the full circumference right the full circle so pretty good jump and he feels like he's he's chopping coming out of the third turn hey man that's great if you're not chopping if you're not chopping out of the gate down the first straight or or even out of the first turn that's great man that's fantastic i would say this is more this is more of a power endurance thing man and so there's two ways I think you can address this if you feel like you're chopping, right? Like if your legs are just not turning over as well, um, definitely longer sprints, right? You could do longer sprints, 30 full cranks long. 30 full, full cranks long is, is pretty good. Um, and I would also consider improving your power endurance and maybe doing some broken sprints, right? Like, like the quarantine intervals uh, on the channel here. All right, thank you for that question, Jacob James. Robert T says, sup coach. Um, Jacob James says, I want to stay on 180s for gate torque. Yeah, man, I, I think you're on the right track here. Me personally, I think it's best to go for the longest crank possible without compromising your spin, right? And even, even if your spin is compromised, then you're just gonna need to train it. Right, you're gonna to need to do um, more sprints, uh, maximum velocity sprints, where you're you're accelerating at a high high cadence, working on that spin. And I think in in your case, you could probably adjust that with either a, a gear change. But here's the thing: if you go a little bit harder, then you need more strength out of the gate. Right, you need more force coming out of the gate, and you know that's hard to adapt to unless unless you're strength training. But I think in, in, okay, so Jacob James says he did the quarantine workout today. The next thing I was going to say was I would definitely focus on your power endurance, the engine, right? And just having the, working on the metabolic capacity, because here's the thing, when you're coming out of the gate, going down the first straight, going in the second turn, that, you're roughly at least 10 to 15, if not 15 seconds already into the race. So you're already moving into another metabolic energy pathway and that energy pathway is going to be more power endurance you're not really firing maximal um, your maximum fast twitch fibers at that point okay because you're already starting to move and shift gears into a different pathway because you, the first 10 seconds you've already burnt up what is called your atp and at that point You've ran out of that. So you have to shift gears. You have to move on to another 
metabolic pathway. If you're not training that metabolic pathway, then I would say that you need to, uh, you need to address that and then see how it goes from there. You're welcome, Jacob James. It's my pleasure. And I'm over here getting texts. Maybe I should. Uh, let's see here. Rocco PM triple seven. He has a quick question on track speed, or maybe it's a comment. Please forgive me if I mess it up. I'm just going to read it anyways. My younger riders, five and seven years old are good out of the gate, but seem to lack track speed. What's a good training regimen to address track speed pumping? Okay. Yeah. So great question. And, and I would say this, this is kind of complimenting, you know, the previous racers question about going up in crank length, right? And he wanted he wanted to figure out ways to improve his ability to spin after the second turn. So I would definitely focus on um, the fitness aspect, but you're talking about pumping. And so I'm glad you brought that up because I think at the end of the day, if we could work on our skills, make our skills better to where we're more efficient. Listen, the jumps on the track, they're, they're really, if you could get into the mindset and view them as opportunities to create speed, not lose speed, and be efficient. And when you're more efficient, then you're gonna create more track speed. It's just, it, it cannot it cannot happen, right? And so, yes, I would absolutely work on the skills of pumping. Um, at five and seven years old, you're not gonna be manually a whole lot, certainly not jumping. Um, so yeah, definitely pumping, absolutely. And I, and I would also say at five and seven years old, if they're working on pumping, you can also alternatively, away from the track, do body weight exercises, exercises like single leg lunges. Well, anytime you do a lunge, it's gonna be a single leg, but do any anything either unilateral or bilateral. Bilateral will be something like a body squat and just do a bunch of those, okay? Are these all the questions I'm getting? Come on guys, let's get more questions in the chat. Kiwi John from New Zealand. Man, what time is it over there? 11 a.m.? Kiwi John has a question. Quick question, Greg. Recovery. As I get older, I definitely notice how long it takes for muscles to recover after a hard workout, i.e. after squats and lunges at the gym. Legs can be sore for days. Yeah, um, I agree, man. You know, I'm, I'm getting older as well. I train regularly. It's part of my lifestyle. And uh, yeah, man, I've noticed, I've noticed myself typically, you know, after a weekend of riding my bike, like let's say I go hard on Saturday, somewhat hard on Sunday, but not really. Typically I can, I can rest like on a Monday and then come back Tuesday and I'm feeling pretty good. Now, nowadays I'm not feeling as easily recovered. I, I need a little bit more time. So what I'm doing is I'm going back to that Sunday workout and I'm actually watching the amount of volume that I'm doing. I'm cutting that in half, and that way I can recover a little bit more. I'm not adding so much stress. So here's the thing. I would say the older you get, the more frequent you need to, you need to train. And of course, you're talking about training in the gym. I would just be conscious of how much volume you're imposing on the body. Now, volume could be in the way of reps or sets. Personally, today, I'm training in the gym, and what I'm doing is I'm not doing anything over five reps. It, there's just no point. I, I don't need to do hypertrophy. Listen, I'm I'm training no different than say yourself who is racing recreationally. I don't need to go through a ton of hypertrophy work and, and going in there and going into the gym and then trying to leave the gym with the goal of leaving it all on the table and you know, someone helping me walk out of the gym, so to speak. That's that's not the game that we're trying to play these days, especially the older we get. There, there's no point of breaking yourself down so much to the point where you can't operate for a couple days. You know, you're a BMX racer. So, you know, you're not, you're not a bodybuilder where you're training five days a week and you're doing split days, going into the gym twice a day. Listen, I, I would say it's best to take a look at your training program, what you're doing at the gym, Take a look at, you know, how many how many reps you're doing, how many sets are you doing? Is there anywhere where you could actually cut some volume down? Okay. So for example, 
for me, I've noticed I've been able to recover and ride my bike on the weekend. I do my I do my leg workout on a Tuesday, so today I did my workout. And right now I'm like, you know, I did single legged squats, you know, a a Bulgarian a, Bul- a Bulgarian split squat with a barbell on my back. 175 pounds. That's that's, you know, around my body weight and yeah, could I go in there and do 6 to 8 reps? Yeah, absolutely. I'm just doing 3 reps and what I'm doing is I'm adding more sets. So if I do three sets at three reps each leg, you know, you're talking nine reps each leg, move on. Of course, there's a bunch of, there's a bunch of reps that warm up to that weight. But, you know, I, I call that my working weight once I get there. What are you doing there? Because if you're doing five sets of, I don't know, 10, 50 reps, is that necessary? Maybe, maybe you could just focus on execution on how fast you lift the weight and do less reps and you can get more out of that. All right, Kiwi, I think, I I hope that helps, man. Watch the volume. And, you know, at the end of the day, when it comes to recovery, you know, sleep is your best friend. You know, uh, there's a good book uh, called Peak Performance and, and they have this equation. Stress plus rest equals gains. I mean, so resting is part of the equation of training, right? If we stress something, we need to rest it. Okay. So keep that in mind. That was something that, you know, my practitioners that I had at an early age in my twenties, when I was racing professionally, I had massage therapists and chiropractors who were really good friends and they were on my team. And they were like, Greg, you know, like you're overtraining. Like when you train, you need a rest. If you train, you rest, you train, you rest. And I couldn't get that through my thick skull because I was thinking, man, I need to train because the other guys are training harder and I know they're training right now and and man, I had this fear of missing out, right? And it wasn't doing me any favors. I was tapping into my adrenal glands. I wasn't able to ride my bike at, at a high level when I practiced it and I was riding my bike a lot under fatigue and when, when you're riding your bike under a lot of fatigue, Listen, you're not, you're actually deprogramming your ability to pedal fast or be explosive. So at the end of the day, you're a BMX racer, man. Use the alternative training as a complimentary way to get faster. It's not the way to get faster. Riding your bike is the way to get faster. Going to the track is how we program. We want to make sure that we're fresh enough to show up to the track and program ourselves to end on a high note with neurological high capacity of speed of discharge. All right, cool. Cool, we're starting to get questions. This is awesome. I hope that helps Kiwi John. Another thing when it comes to recovery, I like foam rollers. If you if you can afford to get massages, I know for me, I mean, it's it's not even amount of uh, about money, it's just about time. And so I, I like using the foam roller and of course, you know, rest, Foam rolling, rest, nutrition. Nutrition is, is always key, right? Like think about like the older we get, the more harmonized diet that we need to have in terms of um, acidity to alkaline, right? I, I've just noticed that the older that we get, listen, because the anything acidic um, is going to be edema. It's going to, be, it's going to cause swelling and, and swelling is not going to allow our muscles to recover. So Think about foods. You know, there's a guy uh, who's the owner of and and founder of Bulletproof, uh, which is uh, a company that's all about optimizing high performance health. They actually started. Um, his name's David Asprey, and he has um, Bulletproof Coffee. And the, I was looking through my social media, and he had a post on how fatty foods will prevent you from recovering. It, it actually causes more harm because it it promotes swelling, edema. And so, and I love French fries. I like, I like to have, a, a, you know, a cheat meal, if you will, um, at least once a week. And so I, I noticed that my gut is slower in terms of the way it moves. And I've noticed that I'm really lethargic, not only before I go to bed, but of course, when I wake up the following day, I'm really... I can, I can just, I can feel it on my skin. It's just like puffy, but listen, the older we get, the diet is really key. And so um, going more alkaline in terms of your foods, vegetables, vegetables at, at the end of the day are, are high alkalinity. Protein, believe it or not, 
it's um, most proteins are not acidity upon consumption. However, when your body digest, when your stomach digests it, you actually need a lot of acid and another thing called pepsin. So there's a bunch of st- there's a bunch of stomach acid uh, that's being produced into your gut and that any leftover and it always overcompensates so any kind of leftover acid listen man you got to you have to combat that with alkalinity stuff right like vegetables so all right i'm going into an area that i'm not it's not my wheelhouse i i'm not a certified nutrition by any means but i do i do pay attention luke do i race pro yes i raced for 15 years and i won over a hundred professional races so Luke must be, he's probably not a race guy, but hey, we welcome you, Luke. Thank you guys. Uh, thank you so much. I am far from a baby boomer, man. I am 47 years old. All right, so what do we got here? Danny Booby from Australia on recovery two day race meets in Australia. We have a few races that are a true two-day meet, three motos, semis, and finals each day. Any advice on what to do to feel fresh for day two? <laughs> Listen, man, I, th- I would say at the end of the day, everyone who has raced the first day, um, you have to presuppose that they're also going to be uh, potentially fatigued the following day, right? It's kind of the same for everybody. I would say at the end of the day, it's all about how you perceive it, Danny. I know for me, doing two-day races, Sunday has always been hard for me as a professional because the following, the that next day, Sunday, we have to be up at 6 a.m. as opposed to Saturday. I could just roll, I can just get out of bed at 8 a.m. and don't even have to practice till 11. But Sunday, they're trying to knock that race out so everyone can get home and hit the road uh, at a decent hour. So Sunday, we have to wake up earlier. We, we tend to not get as much sleep as the day before, depending on when the race ends um at the end of the day try to get as much rest as you can i would say before you go to bed again nutrition is key um if you could do any foam rolling you know massage uh, cryotherapy ice bath anything that you could bring down swelling so your body can recover that's going to give you the best opportunity to combat fatigue uh, the following day for the second day of racing but keep in mind i think at the end of the day it's it's a lot of it is all again it's all mental state dependent so you know i have a i had an athlete true story a guy named david herman david herman was an olympian and man he would always rely on me to help him get into an optimized mental performance state especially on on day 2 because he always based his mental state on how he felt like when he woke up in the morning it's like oh, i don't feel all that great like i feel lethargic I feel tired, my legs are sore. And it's like, and then his mind's just kind of like thinking about it so damn much. And it's like, dude, you have to flip the script, change your mind state. If you could change your mind state, the body will follow and respond. And so I, I had to remind that to him from time to time and it helped every time. Get into the proper mind state and the body will follow. The body's absolutely amazing. If you base everything off of how you feel and your mind state is emotionally low if you will and you're not in the ideal high frequency performance mind state then yes you're definitely going to respond and base your mind state on how you feel and you know what sometimes you have to f those feelings like you can forget the feelings forget them they're not going to do you any good a guy named bubba harris who is a um i think he's won the aba pro title a couple times I don't know how many times. I think he won three times, but Bubba was, he was a badass, man. And uh, I remember one morning we showed up for for practice and we had practice at like 7.30 in the morning pro practice. I'm like, dude, this is such a burn. He's like, listen, man, we only have to do it once on this weekend. You know, if we, if you race, you know, two nationals a month, he's like, dude, we only have to do this twice a month. And when he said that, it was helpful. It snapped me out of it. It's like, hey man, you know what? He has the right frame of mind here, right? He, he reframed it and just said, you know what? It's no big deal. I only have to deal with waking up, you know, twice a month. So at the end of the day, man, I think it's it's all about it's all about the mind state. Right? Everything is state dependent.
Let's see, Ellie BMX, for a 13-year-old intermediate racer, how much should I be working out, e.g. three to four times a week? Okay, so working out, what does working out mean to you? Does that include going to the track, doing sprints, um, doing strength work? Intermediates, it depends on how serious you are, right? Do you have track access? Do you have the ability to sprint in a bicycle-friendly, safe area away from the track? Do you have gym access? At 13 years old, you could probably start going to the gym. If not, are you doing body weight strength exercises? You would be surprised, Ellie. If you go check out bmxtraining.com, there's a two-day free trial. Go on there and check out, like, I don't know, um, the 21-day faster first straight challenge. You will see there's probably six, seven, eight, probably eight to nine workouts a week at the very minimum. You would be surprised. Our workouts don't have to be long and they don't have to be, um, they don't have to be long. And, and because they don't have to be long, you could do two workouts a day. You could do a morning, you could do a morning workout and an afternoon workout and you get a lot done in 45 minutes. Jacob James, I've been doing the five sets, five reps on all your suggestions. Been feeling good and not broken in the morning. That's great. And Jacob, you're, you're what, 15, 16 years old, man? I would say you could probably start ramping up the weight, um, reducing the reps, and focusing on more explosive movement when you lift. Why not, man? Andy Lim. How do you keep your energy level up when there's so much time in between motos? This year's Carolina Nationals had 430 motos, and being that I moved up to 46 to 50 expert, it's the last race of the night. Oh man, I, I hear you, man. You know, I had a couple of uh, a couple of my Winter Circle athletes were at that Rock Hill race where there was a record-breaking 430 motos there, and and I remember supposedly like the last main event was like close to midnight, was it not? And so, you know, at the end of the day, here's the thing. How do you get up for it? You need to have a get up, get up for it routine. So, you know, I have my athletes for the most part, we have a plan 30 minutes before that next race. So let's say they qualified first round. The next race, which is going to be their quarter or their semi at a race like Rock Hill, where you're there for 12 to 14 hours, who knows how long. Listen, man, during the downtime, it's okay to turn off the mental mind state and get back into relaxation mode. And that doesn't mean, you know, going around and running around and burning up your energy. I would say you definitely want to stay low, stay off your feet if you can. If you could sit, you could sit. If you could lay down, lay down. If you could lay down and put your feet up even better, stay hydrated, keep your mind clear. If you have some time, do some meditation in midday. And then... <laughs> I would definitely consider having some kind of 30 minute warm up routine before your next lap, right? So that could begin by, you know, the first 15 minutes, you're warming up, you're doing some neurological activation with some sprints. And then maybe as you get closer, maybe do one or two hard sprints. And that way, you're ready to go get into that, you know, trigger yourself, trigger your anchor to get into your ideal performance mind state. And boom, you're ready to go. Because here, here's the thing. At the end of the day, you're, you're better off being more ready than not ready enough. There's been so many times throughout my career where I've gotten fifth place in the semi. Has anybody here got fifth place in the semi? Um, you know, give me a shout out. Give me a thumbs up in the chat. And tell me, how does it feel when you get fifth place in the semi? I, I feel so charged. I feel like, dang it, I could redo this race again right now, right here. Let's go. And by that time, it's like, dang it, I lost that opportunity. That window of opportunity closed. It's gone. And so, you know, after that race, I'm warmed up. I'm ready to go. So before the race, I wasn't. So you can never, if you're unsure, you can never warm up enough, I would say. And so, you know, mentally get into that performance mind state of whatever you need to feel, whatever you need to feel, whether it's, you know, being empowered, being confident, being aggressive, whatever that is for you, it's different for everybody. And so you have to figure that out for yourself first, get into that state, and then make sure you warm up appropriately physiologically, right? Okay. Marius, good day from Sydney. Hey, is it is it morning or afternoon, guys? So many people coming in from down under. I love it. 
We have Kiwi John, Danny Booby. I think Andy Lim is down under as well, as well as Marius. Man, we have so many people. Jeffrey Ligo gives a thumbs up. Javier Zalata gives a thumbs up, gives a, gives one of those, a bullhorn, whatever you want to call that. Yeah, man, it, it's, it's crazy. Like if you get fifth in the semi, it's crazy how much energy you have. And a lot of it's frustration too. So, um, but I, I definitely wouldn't operate off frustration. Jacob James says 48 years old. Jacob, are you 48 years old, man? Come on, man. I wasn't under that impression. Yeah, so it's down down under, it's 11 a.m. Awesome. All right, so what other questions do we have? We have time for a couple more questions. I think we're doing pretty good. Guys, I want to see more questions in the chat. Let's take a quick break. Give me more questions and I'll answer them right after the break. Hey guys, I have a question. What would it do for you if you could enhance your power out of the gate, enhance your sprint speed down the first straight, enhance your skills, enhance your mental performance mind state? What would that do for your racing or your kids racing? If you're seeing the value of enhancing your BMX performance, consider joining the community of BMX Training Pro and get the same access my Olympic athletes have enjoyed, as well as thousands of BMXers all over the world. Some members use the access to improve their gate start techniques. Some also use the access to keep them motivated to train. And you'll find your reason when you gain access and join BMX Training Pro today. All right, guys. Hey, if you guys are finding value in this video so far in this live chat, or if you're watching on the replay, consider checking out bmxtraining.com. Again, if you're finding value now and you want more, check out bmxtraining.com. Uh, there's a free two-day trial. Man, it's great. We have so many members in there. A lot of guys in the live chat are already members. Thank you guys so much for the support. And again, it's an opportunity to be your coach. Um, let's see here. We have a few more questions coming in. Let's see here. Let's scroll up to the top. How do I feel about Haro race bikes? I think Haro race bikes are great. Good geometry. Um, Luke says, iconic moments on BMX racing, like best races all time. Um, I would check out some of some of the old old school BMX uh, Grand National races on YouTube. I think those are, you know, especially with the pros, I think there's, there's some really cool iconic races there. I think there's one from 1990. Check that one out. I think that's on BMX Archive, uh, that channel. I also think a lot of the Olympic races are, are very iconic. Um, let's see. Tristan says or ask how to get prepared for a state race. Tell me, how are you getting prepared now? What are you doing? What about LDC? Is that Little Dude Components? I think they're awesome, American made, good friends of mine. Jacob James says, can a kettlebell swing substitute for glute bridges? I, I don't, sure, I think it's an alternative. Um, and I would say, you know, any, any way that you could attack the glutes, working on that hip extension is certainly going to help. He doesn't feel like he's getting anything from a bridge. Yeah, so then, you know what I would consider? I would consider doing, oh man, it's off the top of my head. Um, let me see if I can find an exercise for you, Jacob. It's It's, I can't say it, but... I can see it, forgot what it's called. Uh, Marius from Down Under says, when and why should one go clipless? Ooh, good question. What age? Kid, newer rider, um, older rider coming back into the sport, was racing on flats and now everyone's clipped in. When? I would say at the end of the day, you know, it's crazy. I, Let me give you an example. This is a true story, Marius. I, you know, when and why? I, I would say at the end of the day, I was a guy that I kind of fell to the outside pressure, right, of going clipped in. And, and, and basically it was because I think it was 2000 when all the pros, everyone except for me, was clipped in. And I was just being hard-headed, okay? 
I was being hard headed. I, I reveled in the fact that I was the last one to clip in. I was on flats. And I remember being in the main event on flats. And, you know, I, you know, I made it a big deal. They're like, oh yeah, Greg Ramirez was on flat pedals. And I put my feet up and it's like, you know, in hindsight, I was just being goofy, but man, you know, um, I did notice that they were faster. The, 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 the rest of the guys that they were getting on top of the gear, second, third pedal faster than I was. And for me, that's when I realized, you know what, there is a performance advantage here and I should just go ahead and suck it up. Um, cave into my ego, leave my ego, you know, at home and show up to the next race with clipless pedals. For me, that's how it worked. For you, I don't know. It, it really depends. You know, is it, are you racing? Or are you finding a need because, you know, you're underperforming and you're looking for some kind of equipment advantage? Okay, but I don't know if, you know, Great, but are you working out? Are you doing sprints? How often are you going to the track, right? At the end of the day, are you taking action and doing the hard work? Doing the hard work that's easy to do every day, that's also easy not to do, so you might as well do it. Are you doing that, right? Are you investing every day? And if you're investing every day, and you know, I guess where I'm trying to get at is, are you putting yourself in a position to deserve to put clipless pedals on, okay? And, you know, that's not my rule, but I would say at the end of the day, I think that's really important. Are you doing the hard work? Because if you're not, I would say, you know, doing sprints, going to the gym, working on your reaction time, working on your, your you know, things like acceleration position out of the gate, working on getting on top of your second and third pedal. If you're optimizing all those things and you're checking off all those boxes and, and you're finding that they're working or they're, you know, they're marginally working, and so, you know, you might want to add another ingredient into the recipe of your high performance program, then yeah, then maybe at that point, go ahead and try it and give it a go. Um, I know for me, in hindsight, and, and, and you know what, and, and, and I probably shouldn't say this, but because I don't know how this would have worked out as a rookie pro being clipped in, but when I was a rookie racing on flat pedals, I've had some horrific accidents slipping my pedals. I was prone to slipping pedals. I, I was really powerful and, and I would just easily just blow my foot off the, t off the pedal because I would try extra hard at times. And so, you know, I got a scar like right here and right here from slipping my pedal at a race in Burbank at an indoor race, a huge race, fall nationals. And man, I slipped my pedals before this tabletop going into the first turn. Dude, I hit the, I hit the jump with no feet on the pedals. I, I got launched, I endoed, I couldn't control it, smack, concussed, um, had to go to hospital, blew up my face, and yes, you know, in hindsight, I wish I was clipped in, and today, I love clipless pedals, because I don't slip my pedals, I just don't slip my pedals, you know, but at the same time, you know, have, have I had weird wrecks being clipped in? Yeah, I've had wrecks where I couldn't clip out. Oddly enough, I, I hit a pro section, couldn't clip out and did like a half backflip. So, you know, at the end of the day, crashing is crashing. Um, but personally, you know, <laughs> I've had more wrecks on flat pedals than I did clipless. So, you know, that's my take. I just wanted to share that with you. I think it's important for you to figure out, figure it out on your own. And again, go through that checklist of doing all the other things that are contributing to the marginal gains to improve your high performance. If you're doing that, then you're definitely putting yourself in a position to put clubless pedals on. Because here's the thing, if you put clubless pedals on and you're not doing all the hard work, I don't know if you're gonna see a significant difference, right? And then that could potentially mess with uh, your mindset, right? What you value and what you believe. Okay, here we go. I got a question coming in. Okay, Maria says, I'm constantly significantly progressing. Love BMX, riding four to five times a week. Race every week or every second week. And he's also doing sprints and gym at home. Yeah, man. So you're doing the you're doing the you're doing the right things. You're on the right track. You're already contributing to the marginal gains as it pertains to your personal high performance program. How old are you, Marius? Answer me that. 
I'll go on to the next question. Hello, coach. This is from Don Fosto. Hello, coach. 49 years old. I ran in the 80s. Did you run or did you race in the 80s? And I decided to go back last year. What advice do you give me to overcome the shock of adaptation? Man, at the end of the day, you just have to keep imposing the demand. That's that's it. Um, what are, What is the shock that you're experiencing? Is it is it mental or is it physical? Um, if it's physical, listen, um, all you could do is consistently show up and keep imposing the demand and you'll overcome it. You know, it's funny. I'm, I'm glad you brought this up. It's been a while since I've played ice hockey. And in the beginning of this live feed, I, I was talking about how I was moving. Well, I'm moving. I'm, I'm, st I'm still going to be in San Diego, but I'm moving closer to... Uh, an ice skating rink in which they play adult league hockey. They have pickup hockey, um, which is like, you know, practicing games. It's, it's like, put, you know, pick up basketball, if you will, uh, nothing official. And then they also have, um, uh, what do they call it? They call it stick and puck, which is go out on the ice rink and, you know, no games allowed, but you can skate around with a puck. And perhaps if there's a goalie there, you could get some shots on the goalie. No different than going to the BMX track and practicing. And um, I still have all my hockey gear and I was, I was daydreaming the other day, like, man, it'd be great. I'd love to get at least one workout a week, get back on the ice and uh, start skating and shooting the puck around and maybe potentially uh, play some pickup hockey. Same thing, Don. I'm, I know I'm going to be going through that shock where it's like, whoa, man, um, do I re even remember how to skate, Right. Uh, do I know, do I know do I remember how to go from forwards to backwards? Do I know how to stop forward strides. Can I do backward crossovers like I used to? And I know I can. It's going to be awkward at first. I'm going to have to get my legs underneath me. But at the end of the day, listen. Most of that neurological programming's there. It's probably just a little bit fuzzy. And so at the end of the day, if you keep imposing the demand, that neurological programming is going to get strengthened again through the concept of through the concept of myelination. Myelination, interesting, awesome concept. Um, basically, myelination is the idea of, well, it's the idea of making movements uh, more automatic by repetition, right? Through osmosis of repetition, you're making those connections of the neurological pathway stronger and therefore it happens easier and there's no leaks in the communication of those movements happening, right? At the end of the day, all of us BMX athletes are myelinating, okay? And so what does myelinating even mean? And let me give you, let me give you um, a, a different way to look at it. Myelination, and, okay, so let's see here. I don't know if you can see this, but here's my ethernet cord, right? This is a cord, well, please forgive me, I'm knocking over a light. This is an ethernet cord of how I'm streaming uh, my internet connection from the router down to my laptop right here where I'm controlling this live stream. And so um, this wire is really thick, but more importantly, um, the casing around it is really strong. Now, if there was holes in here and the, maybe perhaps this sheath, of the wiring is not as strong, then the signal in a way wouldn't be as strong. So how it works for us is that in myelin, in the concept of myelinating or myelination, when we're doing a gate start, for example, or we're starting a manual, um, we're making these connections stronger every time we do it, okay? And the stronger the connection, I'm sorry, um, the, the, the thicker the sheath around this connection of the entire body doing that movement, the easier it's going to be because the signals don't get lost. So think of like, think of doing something foreign that you haven't done. Maybe, you know, brushing with the opposite. I, I brush my teeth with my right hand. If I do it with my left hand, that pathway is, it's terrible. It sucks. However, if I do it after a while, myelination starts to happen by osmosis and I will get used to it. That shock and that awkwardness will be gone. So 
there's something that you guys learned again today, the concept of myelinating or myelination. Check it out. Maria says, 32, rode 7 to 16 years ago, getting back after 15 year break, always rode flats. Yeah, <laughs> I called it, didn't I? Um, yeah, you know, give it a try, man. Honestly, I, it's, uh, if you're comfortable on the bike, you're comfortable with your skills, you're comfortable riding in a pack, then I would say if, if you have all those comfort levels checked, checked off, then go ahead and give the clipless a try. Have you clipped in on a road bike? Have you clipped in on another bike? Oh, here's a good question. Here we go. Uh, Jig801 asks, Hello, coach. Do you think a Peloton stationary bike is good for training to race? Ooh, good question. I, I like Pelotons. I think they're great. The concept, of course, is the hit concept for the most part, right? Most of these classes are like 45 minutes long and high intensity in interval training. That's what it is. Hit training, H-I-I-T. And yes, I think, I think there is to a point I think there's a time and place to do it. Um, in the beginning of the show, uh, one of our guests here and, and member of our community, Jacob James, was talking about his fitness and his ability to have the fitness to spin longer cranks after the second turn. And I, we were talking about power endurance. Hit interval training um, would definitely help as it pertains to power endurance. And, and honestly, the Peloton, it might be a little bit too much. It might, it's, it's really, really hard. It's probably going to be more beneficial if you're a Criterium road racer where you're doing road racing for an hour uh, in a parking lot, right? Where you're, you're hitting these big wattage spikes, coasting, hitting it again. So it's, it's not as specific as doing, say, like, um, broken sprints the, the, and there's a workout on this channel uh, it's it's the quarantine workout that I did with these guys during COVID last year and and basically what we did was we replicated um, sprints with micro rest as if we were going through jumps and then hitting these sprints again and then resting for a couple minutes the problem with uh, the Peloton classes is that you're pretty much following the instructor and you're pedaling the entire time. And sometimes you're just not getting enough recovery because you're training and doing these intervals under stress. And that's what it's designed for. It's, it's designed for uh, that concept of hit, high interval intensity training. And so um, it can work and it, it can also hurt you because it might be a little bit too much. Now, here's the thing. If, if you're doing this in the off season and you have, you know, like like here in America in, in, in the, you know, the, the northeast, if you will, or, or northern states where there's lots of um, inclement weather and weather that prevents people from training outdoors and, you know, the track's not available, nor is it open like it is over here almost year round on the West Coast here in San Diego, for example, then yes in the off season, that's a great opportunity for you to, to break out the Peloton and participate in those classes two to three times a week. I think it's great. I had an athlete, uh, not an athlete, sorry. I had a teammate um, when I road raced several years ago, uh, Robbie Miranda, okay? The ex-pro, the ex, ex gold medalist. We were teammates on a road cycling team where we raced criteriums here in the Southern California area. We are on this team called Surf City Cyclery. Robbie is a full-time deputy sheriff and he, you know, in full-time uh, doing that and raising a family, and he had a hard time at the races because he didn't have enough time to ride his bike and in road racing, you have to put in, you know, anywhere from eight to 12 hours of training, training endurance, doing intervals, doing this, doing that. He couldn't find the time to train and his racing was suffering. He actually bought a Peloton and trained on that three to four times a week doing 45 minute workouts. And man, quickly, he got, in, he got into shape specifically for these 45 to 60 minute races uh, in Southern California doing criterium racing. 
he started kicking ass. He started winning. So, you know, it's perfect for that. Is it, is it good for BMX? Again, you know, that's up for you to decide if it's, if you're doing BMX as a lifestyle and you want to do other things, you know, I'd say once a week, we wouldn't hurt you. It's not going to hurt. But I think, you know, the more serious you get with your racing, where you're, where you're traveling a lot, um, then you definitely want to dedicate a lot more time going more specific in the discipline and the specificity of BMX explosive movements, gym work, sprint work. And, the, and these are kind of, these are workouts where they're real repetitive, they're boring because you need lots of rest in between sets because, and because you're trying to train the neurological component of, of speed of discharge, right? You, you definitely need more rest in between sets. And when you're doing these reps, it's really, it's really all out and explosive and you're not doing a whole lot. It doesn't seem like you're burning a whole lot of calories. Your heart rate doesn't get, get up a whole lot. You might not be sweating. And it's like, man, I'm not really working hard. And that's, I, I would say that's probably a, a big problem when it comes to BMX training is having the discipline to say, you know what, I am a BMX sprinter, not an endurance athlete who's trying to be the best at being fit. You're trying to be the best at sprinting. You guys are sprinters. You guys are short sprinters. And in today's racing, there's not a whole lot of pedaling. And so every time you guys pedal, they have to be meaningful. They have to be powerful. They have to be explosive. And certainly doing endurance work, doing high inter intensity interval training isn't necessarily gonna complement that movement. Being powerful, being explosive is king. If you can get out front, it's hard for other guys to come around you straight up. It's hard to make up ground in BMX. So if you guys can focus on the concept of working on your skills of, of efficiency and power and being explosive and, and being specific in terms of that explosiveness, you know, again, I think that's more king than just being the best at exercising. <laughs> okay. Um, good stuff. Guys, man, I am so honored and grateful for you guys to show up on this live feed. If you guys are watching this on the replay, I'm grateful for you to show up. Again, if you guys found this, uh, if you found this beneficial, if you found value and you guys want more, download the free guide uh, in the comments below or in the description below. Um, check out bmxtraining.com. You guys enjoy the rest of your night. If you're in Australia, enjoy the rest of your day on Wednesday because you guys are a day ahead and enjoy the rest of your week. I'll see you guys next Tuesday. You guys keep working hard, doing the little things that make a big difference in the long game, right? We're playing a long game when it comes to BMX training and your performance. And again, if you're not seeing the gains in terms of the results, work on, work on finding those progressions and the little things every day. Are you getting faster? Are you, are you going from the bottom of the pack to racing to the top of the pack? Okay. It's not always about winning. Winning's awesome. Winning's really hard to do. It's also easy to do, but don't beat yourself up over it. We're playing a long game here. Okay. You guys have a great week. Thank you so much. I'm grateful. Again, Jacob James says, thank you. Jig801 says, thanks. Um, uh, Luke says, bye coach. See you Tuesday. Hey, Luke, thanks for showing up, asking some good questions. Looking forward to hearing more about uh, your journey if you plan on racing. Um, and yes, you guys, I am out. See you guys.